Hey, what's going on YouTube? It's CJ. I want to welcome you guys back for episode 10 of my 120 gallon reef system. Now it's time to finally add livestock to the tank. That's right. Finally adding livestock to the tank. Now, of course, it involves multiple trips to my local LFS, also known as Aquatica. For those that are new to my channel, I did a full store tour and interview with the owner about a year ago, but their video is still accurate today. You know, still tons of candy and a great selection of healthy fish. And that's where we're going to start. Now, before we go any further, I do want to make sure I address the elephant in the room because I know some of my subscribers are looking at this thinking, you know, what the hell is CJ doing? This guy is not quarantining his fish. He's floating and just throwing them right in the tank. Well, honestly, you guys are 100% correct. And I'm not discounting or swaying anyone new or anyone that's, you know, is in the hobby to stop quarantining or not quarantine because I'm not naive. There definitely is a value in it. And there also is a risk with it with finicky fish not surviving the quarantine. But at the end of the day, in my system, I look at it like this. The fish I'm getting are coming from a trusted LFS. I'm, a, I'm able to view those fish over a period of days if I choose, make sure they're eating, make sure they're not showing any signs of those epidemic level diseases meaning marine velvet or you know parasites that can wipe out your tank and then i feel confident enough to bring them home now when it comes to ick in all honesty for people that just quarantine their fish and nothing else you're still not preventing ick from getting in your system it can it get into your system through anything honestly anything you introduce it can have on invertebrates it can have on frag plugs it's basically a protozoa a small itty bitty thing that can travel into your tank through anything foreign so the only true way to prevent ick would be to quarantine your fish quarantine your corals quarantine your invertebrates for a period of time add them all to the tank and then not add anything else new to your tank for the life of that tank and now let's be honest who is going to do that i know there are some hobbyists that actually have went the, to that extreme and more than likely those are the hobbyists that have had their tanks wiped out with marine velvet or any of those parasites. I've been lucky enough to not experience that yet. So from where I am today in the hobby and my experience level, that's pretty much my take on quarantining and pretty much why I'm gonna keep doing what I do in this system and we're gonna keep it moving. Now, after acclimating and adding fish, I also took this time to acclimate and add my first members of my cleanup crew. Now, I know a lot of people are wondering, you know, why didn't you add this during the diatom bloom or why did you wait so long? Well, honestly, guys, for two reasons. The first one is this. If I jumped the gun and added a huge cleanup crew to the system while the diatom bloom was happening, two things would have happened. First one is the cleanup crew may have died because the cycle still wasn't complete in my system. And the second thing, they probably would have starved because diatoms are not permanent. That food source, they looked abundant would have quickly evaporated and left over a bunch of hermit crabs and snails and everything else I would have added. And they pretty much all would have died and just added to nutrients in the water. So definitely a no-go. From what I've learned, it's best to add a cleanup crew based off what's available at the time and then build up from there. So for now, all I have is six trochus snails and 15 hermit crabs. And these guys are doing a great job. Now this next subject, is non-debatable in my opinion building a screen top for your reef tank glass top screen top doesn't matter some kind of top to keep any and all of those suicidal fish from taking that leap of faith you know and drying up to that fish potato chip on your floor beside your tank trust me guys whether you buy this kit from brs or from home depot like i did for 11 dollars, that investment is going to pay for itself 20 times over during the life of your tank just imagine, one $30 fish jumps, that was a screen top. Four $30 fish jump, then you just, you know, it's just not smart. So, highly recommend it. Now, I'm choosing a screen top because it allows all of the light penetration. It allows for all of the gas exchange to still occur, but still protect my fish from escaping the tank. Now, the easier way to do this would have been just cutting it to fit the inside of the tank and just resting the screen top on top of the Euro brace. That would have worked, but honestly, I wanted to go for something a little cleaner. So after a little trial and error, actually a lot of trial and error, I got it to fit the inside diameter of the Euro brace, and I supported it with a couple of plastic clips that came with the kit. And I notched out the back corners for the gyro course to fit through. So it ended up working out pretty well. I mean, it fits. 
honestly, it fits perfect. And it's supported by the gyro cords on the back and the clips on the front. So this pretty much eliminated any excuse for me keeping a screen top on the tank because, you know, it looks good. It doesn't take away from the rimless or the Euro brace look and it keeps the fish in. So, you know, it's a win-win. So let's go ahead and keep it moving. So just a quick reminder, just in case anyone's new, make sure you hit that notification bell beside the subscribe button, not only for these updates, but to be notified when I'm going live because I actually reveal a lot, including what fish I'm gonna be adding way before these updates on live stream. So just keep that in mind if you wanna stay up to date on the latest. But for everyone else that did not know, I am now a Tang owner of not one, not two, not three, but four tanks in this 120 gallon system. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about that and what I've experienced over this last week. But first, let's cover a little bit about this food you see floating around because that also was a challenge in itself. When I first put these guys in the tank, they were understandably skittish. You know, the first day I didn't even worry about feeding them. Second day, I did introduce New Life Spectrum pellets and Refrenzy Nano, the frozen food. Still zero luck. So. It wasn't until I went and picked up some of this frozen mysis, some of the herbivore flakes, and started mixing a little garlic and celcom with it to give it a little extra flavor and nutritional value to where these guys really started going after it. So, you know, that's definitely a major box to check off in the tank, especially with certain fish I have in here that are known to be finicky and not want to eat. So definitely glad I was able to get this to work. Whenever you add a new fish to your system, your tank normally pays the price, you know, meaning your ultimate goal is to get everyone comfortable with eating. So you normally offer, you know, multiple types of food, multiple days in a row, and it basically ends up collecting in your rock work or going over your overflow down into your filter flaws or filter socks, and you gotta get it out of your system. So in my situation, I built my sump to where the first tray overflows into a filter floss which is easily removable. You don't have to worry about cleaning it or anything. I just take it out, toss it in the garbage, and replace it with a nice clean pad to collect more, you know, debris and detritus and leftover food and whatever else. Now it's not foolproof, you know, some stuff gets past it, but a majority of the larger chunks are trapped in this floss. But that's only one part of the equation. Second part is my skimmer and my algae scrubber. They do a great job of pulling those organic and inorganic materials from the water which also helps keep the water nice and clean. But once again, none of this stuff works on its own. They all work in tandem and they all play a crucial part in keeping this tank clean. Even with all those things being said, nothing can replace the value of a good old fashioned water change. You know, getting your hands in the tank, taking a power head and blowing out all the crevices on this Bukani rock, because I know it traps, you know, mysis and flake and whatever else the fish didn't eat. So I blow that out, turn the gyros up, get everything whipping around the tank, and then start my water change process. And it basically includes a 40 gallon water change, basically, I would say 40% of the tank's water volume. I always siphon the sand bed, especially this early in the game, because it helps me remove any of the detritus or smaller particles in the sand I don't want. And after that, pump the fresh water in, and we're ready to move on, and hopefully, you know, keep these nitrates and phosphates in control. Now my last test result, my phosphates were still at 0.11, pretty much the same as they were before I added the fish, but they haven't decreased or increased. So still got a little work to do as far as that go, but overall, I'm definitely not complaining. Even after adding six fish within a week's time, my water clarity is still great, and the quality, from what I can tell, is great as well, meaning I don't have high nitrates, and I'm definitely not getting any signs of the high algae or anything else that was in the tank while it was cycling, trying to make a return. Now, of course, you know, I know that has a lot to do with the cleanup crew I added and these tangs. But keep in mind, tangs are huge waste producers. You know, it's one thing to hear about it, but it's another thing to actually watch one of these things drop a load in your tank, watch the gyro pump suck it up, and just broadcast it all over the system. So 
it definitely is a surprising sight, but it's something that, you know, I'm going to have to start dealing with. I'm in the Tang world now, and I'm really happy to, you know, gain these experiences moving forward in the hobby. Now, I know some of you all may be wondering, you know, is this going to work out, CJ? I mean, adding all those Tangs at once, is it really a good idea? And honestly, I can't tell you yes or no. This is one of those situations understanding tangs are aggressive fish especially powder blues powder browns you know yellow tangs basically any tangs in the same family will have aggression toward each other there's just no avoiding that the best thing i could do was introduce them all at the same time meaning no one has time to claim the whole tank as their own no one has time to you know become a dominant fish basically throwing them all in at the same time to where they can work it out together and hopefully, and I do mean hopefully, coexist in the same system. But time will tell. You know, is it a foolproof plan? Of course not. If I have to remove a fish, I will remove a fish. But I'll tell you what, after a week's time, no fin damage. I see a little scuffle here and there as far as chasing. But overall, I'm not seeing anything that I'm really concerned with long term, at least yet. So what is the final stock list plans for this tank? Well, I'm off to one hell of a start, you know, no denying that, but I'm still not sure how it's all going to work out with the tanks. Ultimately, I do want four large fish, basically four tanks in the system. If it ends up being these four, that'll be fantastic. If not, I'll have to make adjustments to that, but basically it'll only be four maximum. Dwarf angels, I do have a flame angel in here. I would like to add two other dwarf angels. Now, whether I can get away with an additional multi-bar or multi-color like I had before, if I can get them eating, great, or maybe a pair of Potter's Angels, something. But I do want three Dwarf Angels. Now, when it comes to the Rasses, I definitely want a large amount of Rasses in this tank. Now, I already have a Yellow Chorus Rass. I'm thinking about adding a Christmas or Melanaris, a bunch of different Furry Rasses, just a large assortment of colors and movement around the rock work is what I want. So besides those, you know, of course, my sand sifting gobies, I'll add one of those later in the game whenever my tank has enough life built up in the sand to support it. I'll definitely add one of those fish and maybe a blenny, something to help control algae on the rock. Now, as far as any other pod eaters, mandarin, scooter blennies, as much as I would love to have one of those, it really depends on if I can support it with all the pot eating rasses I may have and everything else in the tank. I'm still open to it, but we'll see. So as you guys can tell, the stock list is somewhere around 15 to 20 fish, a mixture of tangs, rasses, dwarf angels, and blennies, but I can't tell you the exact type yet. That's pretty much as far as I've gotten at this point. So what kind of corals am I gonna add? I'm sure someone out there is asking that question. Honestly, this is going to be a mixed reef. I would say 30 to 40% SPS corals, a lot more than I've had before. LPS, softies, but I will be, you know, going a little more high end as far as the corals in this system. But keep in mind, that's way later down the road. You know, we'll be adding a calcium reactor, controller, those type of things to help supplement the system and keep it stable. But as of right now, my primary focus is keeping this thing fouler working on my stock list, enjoying the fish, you know, enjoying the tank maturing, growing algae, getting a steady parameters, getting everything where I want it before I start adding those corals. So I think it's a good stopping point though. This fish definitely drugging a little longer than I wanted it to, but it was a lot to cover. So if you guys have any questions, you know what you can do. And as always, hey, like, comment, subscribe. You guys do what y'all do. Y'all be easy and happy reefing.